Buenas and half a day. Thank you all for being here. The public hearing on the Committee on Housing, Utilities, and Public Safety is now called to order. It is 1.02 p.m. For the record, in accordance with 5GCA, Chapter 8, Subsection 8107, thank you. Notices were sent out via e email to all senators and all main media broadcasting outlets on March 19th, 2018, and the second notice on March 22nd. Today, we're going to hear two bills, uh, Bill number 206 and Bill number 251. The first bill we will address is Bill number 206. Bill number 206-34 is an act to add new subsection 51101B12, 51102-alpha-3 November, and 51102-alpha-3 O. All of Chapter 51, Title 17, Guam Code Annotated, relative to the inclusion of the firefighter personnel of the Aircraft Rescue and Firefighting Unit as a peace officers and the department heads of the Department of Youth, Youth Affairs and the Aircraft Rescue and Firefighting Unit as members of the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission, which is the post. Uh, just a little bit of backstory of, of this edition. It was uh, early on last year where we went to a post commission meeting um, and also meeting with the post commissioner that they requested to include um, ARF into the post statute. Uh, another, another backstory is that DYA, they are still required to do the uh, tests, the physical fitness tests, but they were not a voting member, so this is uh, an effort to make them a voting member as part of the, as part of the post commission. I'd like to thank Vice Speaker Chalahi and Secretary Senator Regine Lee for joining me here today. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call up um, David Afison, Sean Nelson, Dennis, Santo Tomas, and Mr. Klitsky, if you'd like to give testimony. Uh, we'll start with the We'll start with the, um, Mr. Fison and then Mr. Nelson, and then Mr. Santo Tomas, and then Senator Klitsky. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, but I'm just a little nervous. That's but good afternoon, Madam Chairman, Honorable Senators, good afternoon. and thank you for your time and attention. I will lead off by ethically saying my stance. I strongly support the bill, 206S34, as introduced by Senator Nelson, to include both DYA and the airport firefighters to become members of the post commission. We DYA juvenile youth correction officers are officially listed in post as category one peace officers, and we strive to meet post standards both physically through the PFQT and in our efforts that are catching up to meet tra training and education requirements. It is vital that our role and commission becomes a member of the board. We also convey our progress and challenges overall as the intent is not only to meet post standards, but also to ensure the public that DYA is also held to equal standards to serve the public as peace officers. It's important to know the tremendous support, guidance, and assistance we have been receiving from all the other law enforcement departments, GCC, and other agencies as well. Furthermore, Specifically for our hardworking team at DYA, we have been sincerely active to the post requirements as a category one. It is noteworthy to, mention, noteworthy to mention that we are not only exposed to the minors or the juveniles who have been charged with serious offenses that range from manslaughter, kidnapping, robbery, to multiple offenses. We also have clientele with bail ranging from $5,000 to $100,000, and the charges increase from juvenile to adult charges. So there are still court ordered to report to DYA's youth correction facility. So as I strongly advocate for this bill to be passed, I humbly and altruistically thank all of you senators for your ethical support to pass this bill. We, the peace officers of White's Youth Correction Facility under DYA continue to grow and evolve to higher standards as public servants. Yeah. Thank you, Superintendent Afaisen. Officer Nelson. Do you have a testimony you'd like to read or give any testimony or comment? No. No? 
Okay. Commissioner. Again, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Speaker, Senator Bisco Lee. Uh, my name is Dennis Santo Tomas. I am the Executive Director for the Guam Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission, or POST, and thank you for taking time this afternoon to listen to our testimonies. I kind of combine my testimony, so I'm going to just extract out uh, the portion that applies to this bill. So I'd like, I would like to first uh, begin by providing testimony in support of Bill 206-34 COR. This bill proposes to include both the Department of Youth Affairs, or DYA, and the Aircraft Rescue and Firefighting Unit, or ARF, as official members of the Post Commission. DYA has attended all the Post Commissions over the past several years um, under the former directorship of uh, former Director Adonis Mendiola, and this partic participation continues to this current day under the new leadership of Peter Alexis Ada. Despite DYA not being a voting member, he has always uh, sat in uh, the meetings, offered very uh, um, useful discussion in, in helping the commission in our, in our problem development for uh, workable solutions for the, for the post. Um, we also recently uh, acquired um, ARF. Um, they started attending the meeting in the latter part of 2017. Uh, with Acting Fire Chief Daniel Stone as their representative, and he too has quickly um, uh, learned the advantages of being part of the commission, the knowledge that's being shared, and uh, which is helping him uh, tackle problems that are found in his own ARF, which prior to that, they're more or less acting as an independent entity or unit. So, um, and even with them being just given uh, only a few months to prepare for the physical fitness qualification, qualification test, they quickly jumped on the bandwagon and have been administering the PFQT to their members at ARF. So because DYA and ARF have so much to offer to the commission, which is evidenced by their active participation and, um, and their offering up of solutions to discussions, I fully support Bill 206-34. COR to add DYA and ARF as official members of the Commission. That concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Senator Kliski? Thank you very much. Honorable Senators, good morning. Good afternoon. I was a little bit behind times today. Thank you. There was an ad in the paper today that, a story in the paper today that piqued my curiosity to take a looker, a longer look at Bill 206. And uh, that article Police consult with AG over who can conduct arrests. So if you haven't seen it, it'd probably be a good idea to take a look at it because the uh, chief of police has some question as to who can conduct arrests. Uh, later on, though, in the story, at the end of the story, he said, during a press conference to announce the establishment of that task force, the GPD chief crew said park patrol officers and conservation officers can legally ticket and arrest people violating the law. All these peace officers, whether you're conservation, whether you're park ranger, whether you're police officer, you all have the same authority, same jurisdiction, Cruz said at a December press conference. Now the article goes into explaining why maybe the chief has had second thoughts. But reading that, and being a little bit familiar with the subject matter, I have second thoughts because a police officer, let's take a term that we're all familiar with, a peace officer, a police officer has more power and authority than the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. A police officer, a Guam policeman, could, I'm not saying he should or it's the right thing to do, but he could. He could grab anybody, slap handcuffs on him, fill out some papers, take him to a detention facility, 
have him incarcerated in that detention facility until that person is brought before a magistrate, which has to occur no later than 48 hours or two days after he's arrested. So a police officer all by himself without any other authority has the ability to put somebody in jail for two, hour, for two days. That's a lot of power. And police officers also have the ability to conduct warrantless arrests. And we have a very liberal warrantless arrest statute here. And of course, if a police officer is to conduct a warrantless arrest, let's hope he's seen law and order on TV so he will have memorized that Miranda warning. Because if he hasn't, even if it is a, a proper arrest, Prosecution may be difficult because the statements of the arrestee might not be admissible. Searches are complicated. Conducting a search is full of traps for the unwary, as is conducting an inventory. For example, if a police officer arrests someone who's driving a car, takes the, takes the car into custody, He's going to conduct an inventory of the car to see what's in there before it's impounded. Well, lots of times interesting things are found, but if it's not done properly, then its evidentiary value is gone. Police officer has the ability to detain someone, to restrict his liberty, to make him stop what he's doing and stand still. Police officer has the ability to do what's called a Terry stop. That is a police officer, if given the benefit of his experience, suspects criminal activity afoot. He could stop anybody walking down the street to make sure that the person is not armed. This is an awful lot of power. And uh, I hadn't paid much attention to the statute dealing with who is and who is not a peace officer until I saw this bill. No, I confess here, I, I should have been paying attention more, more uh, a lot sooner because if a person is not in a position to do all of the things I just described, I don't want that person to be a peace officer. That's too much power, too much authority, too great an ability to make a mistake, etc., unless the person has had the proper training to do all of those things, like a police officer does. So that's why I testified against this bill. No disrespect to those mentioned in uh, section three of the bill. And if you're, you're satisfied that they can do all of the things that a peace officer can do, that's part of it. Second part of it is, do they do, do, does everyone need to be a peace officer? And I'd say no. I would say that we should be very careful as to who we designate as a peace officer in the law, and only those people who need to be peace officers should be peace officers. The um, idea that everybody who works somewhere around somebody who's in custody ought to be a peace officer, I don't think is a good one. Uh, and I can say that from personal experience. I was the director, put it this way, I spent some time at DOC, okay? <laughs> Maybe not enough. Maybe I should, anyhow, I was there. And I was not a peace officer. And there would have been absolutely no reason for me to be a peace officer. And the reason that there would have been no reason for me to be a peace officer was because I wasn't a correctional officer. That's not why I was there. I was there to do a lot of things, but not to be out on the range with the inmates, not to transport inmates to court, not to do any of the things that corrections officers are trained to do. And at least at that time, corrections officers were pretty well trained, and I don't have any reason to think that they aren't anymore. So it makes sense for a corrections officer to be a peace officer because we're seeing, unfortunately now, there are lots of occasions where a corrections officer has to make an arrest when he finds people 
smuggling uh, contraband into the prison, etc. But um, in short, if we continue on the trend that we're going on now, the hall monitors at George Washington are going to be down here asking to become peace officers. I think we're going on go a little too far. And uh, along the same lines of what I just mentioned, I have had the opportunity to observe the current director of corrections and the current deputy director of corrections presenting themselves in costumes. Presenting themselves in costumes. They were dressed like corrections officers. They're not corrections officers. Things like this, this misconstruing of what it means to be a peace officer, what peace officers do, the kind of training they need, cannot lead to a good result. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman, honorable members of the committee. Thank you very much, Senator Klitsky. Um, the Post Commission has been in existence uh, since 1998. And so some of the uh, emphasis that was really focused on, at least in my, this term, was the, um, was the physical fitness test. We can look back and, and research why previous legislatures decided to call them the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission. If a person is physically fit, he can be a peace officer? No, I'm just saying within our term, that this was, this was how it came yeah. about, but this post commission has been in existence yeah. for more than 10 years. I'd be the last person in this building to, talk, to speak against physical fitness. And yes. I certainly hope that peace officers are physically fit, but I don't see that it necessarily follows that someone who undergoes physical training must be a, a peace officer. I, yep. you're, you're absolutely right, Senator. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I'd like to open the, um, some questions, if my colleagues have any questions for the panel. Thank you all for your testimony. Superintendent Fison, are the DYA officers, um, okay, I'm gonna read, this is from the existing chapter 51, the post commission mm -hmm. definition of peace officers the director and all employees of the Department of Youth Affairs who are engaged in juvenile detention and rehabilitation work as designated by the director of the Department of Youth Affairs. So who has been, which of you are peace officers? All. Right now identified within, within our department, we've broken down into three divisions. We have our division for youth development and our division of special services Within the Division of Special Services, we have two facilities, our youth correction, as well as our cottage homes. So any of the personnel within our Division of Special Services are classified as the peace officers within the two facilities under DYA. Are you um, considered in any other statute as peace officers? Well, this time I saw the post, that's one of the standards that we're pushing to see where uh, at we are juvenile correction officers, but in regards to the posts regarding the physical fitness tests, mm -hmm. as well as the actual education requirements to become a peace officer, those are kind of some of the standings we want to kind of catch up to in regards to law enforcement overall. Yeah, this, this is where some of the responsibilities across the board, and if I may compare it to uh, at a macro level, to a simple a military buildup of branches from the Army, Navy, Marines, a lot of the branches do the same as service members overall. And everyone has different operations. Everyone has the same, actually similar PT tests and different standards overall. So they're all classified as service members, but not everyone is gonna be pulling within our post, this, as a peace officer, the same, the same duties and responsibilities that we expect the police to be conducting, that we expect uh, the other law enforcement agencies to be conducting. But for DYA to have officers, also is quite vital from my perspective as the superintendent. I was also a counselor as a social worker. With the new millennium coming about, the entire reform about incarceration within juvenile facilities has slowly decreased 
where our focus in regards to, as peace officers are all going to be focused towards community level approaches within our system here, especially on island. Our entire, our entire facility has not grown tremendously, but our status as peace officers has to grow directly out of being just juvenile correction officers, strictly within our facility monitoring clients, juveniles and adolescents of who's incarcerated for status offenses or non-status offenses. So that's, Senator, that's where I hope that answers your question to where we officially classify ourselves as peace officers, but sincerely and not to be misconstrued, many officers that we have do not qualify or meet the standards of post educationally at this time. All right. But uh, all right, let me let me ask you a couple more yeah. questions. So first of all, um, it looks to me like you are under the post law considered mm -hmm. a peace officer or the, the DYA. That's correct. Officers are considered peace officers, but they're just not represented on the commission. Yes. So that's what this bill tries to do is to put you one of you as a representative on the commission. But as to whether you qualified as a peace officer or not, that's already been defined. But, but in, in relation to Senator Klitschke's mm -hmm. comment, is your, are all of your officers conducting correctional duties or only some? I'm gonna round that up to approximately 85%, 80% of our 47 officers that we have and I also have five officers outside. So just to get the numbers correct, I have five officers assigned to the resource center outside of our correction facility. And you, you think they should be meeting uh, peace officer standards also? Absolutely, because they're also going to be doing law enforcement as well as court order compliance, as similar to probation officers, similar to our actual juvenile investigation section with GPD, the JAS. So it's quite similar, but these are for individuals who have already been charged uh, who have been adjudicated, who have been given a trial or are given a chance while they're on probation prior to their cases being continually uh, handled within, the, within our uh, actual judicial side. Right. This bill would not change the pay. The pay scale has already been determined and you're... Again. That, so this is only, it's only membership on this commission. Okay. All right, yeah, because I, even I was a little confused about what we were trying to do here. Okay, so... Um, Sorry. Again, yeah, it's um, you bring up a valid point, and that's kind of. I, I'm glad the. I sincerely appreciate the foresight that we're having, where we're slowly leading in that direction in regards to being listed as a category one, because there's certain standards that we also like to meet and assist, island wide in regard to being an officer under the post commission. Are are you considered that already? I guess. You, are you already considered a category one? Yes. That's, that's, those are the standards yes, that Senator. you are meeting. All right. Again. Okay. Um, all right. No further questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Speaker. All right. Thank you very much for coming um, to give your testimony. We will now move to Bill, bill number 251-34. Just for the record, um, just for the record, uh, we did not get anyone from the airport rescue and fire present uh, for the for bill number two hundred six dash thirty four. Okay. Bill number 251-34 is an act to implement and amend fees and charges assessed by the Guam Fire Department as referenced in Public Law 2902, which was uh, sponsored and co-sponsored by myself, Vice Speaker Terlahi, and Senator Lee. As you may know, the government of Guam is currently in a financial crisis due to the recent Federal Tax Cuts and Jobs Act signed into law by President Trump on December 22, 2017. The GFD is a critical service to our island, which must remain open to service and ensure the safety of people. In May 2017, Fire Chief Joyce Nicholas and I met um, and in several hearings previous to that. He requested to have an update in the fee schedule. 
The fee schedule that we are going to focus on here is on, on the fire codes. It does not at this time um, address uh, emergency medical services. Um, and just as a, as, a, as a little history, the, the Uniform Fire Code was last updated in 1997. The fees were adopted in 2006. In 2009, the International Fire Code was adopted. Uh, however, the fees remained the same. Uh, in 2010, the legislature then changed and adopted uh, Chapter 73, Title 10, GCA to, adapt, to adopt the International Fire Code in place of the Uniform Fire Code. So now today we come here uh, a little over 10 years to address the, this fee schedule, or close to 10 years to address the fee schedule and its updates. I'd like to thank I'd like to thank Chief Joey Manabusin, uh, Commissioner Santa Tomas, Ms. Chief Burrier, Castro, Uggen, and Bern Reynold Castro, Reynold Castro, and Sedfri Linsangen. So thank you for coming. We'll start with uh, you. Half a day, Madam Chairperson and members of the Committee on Housing, Utilities, Public Safety, and Homeland Security. My name is Darren Breuer, and I am the Acting Fire Chief for the Guam Fire Department. Thank you for this opportunity to present testimony on Bill 251-34, an act to implement and amend fees and charges assessed by the Guam Fire Department as referenced in Public Law 2902. The mission of the Guam Fire Department includes fire and emergency services, emergency medical services, and code enforcement. In keeping with our administration's direction to keep efficiencies and, spe and specific to this subject, revenue enhancement, we have worked very hard to present an acceptable schedule that is consistent with the economies of scale and cost recovery while maximizing revenue potential with a final intent to enforce regulatory compliance and increase safety. Through Public Law 2252 to establish the Fire Life and Medical Emergency Fund, FLAME under 10 GSCSA, Chapter 72, Subsection 72106. A special fund to be used for the purchase of critical maintenance and repair of essential emergency rescue and firefighting vehicles, emergency life support and medical equipment, and training for emergency medical technician and paramedic certifications as well as emergency medical and paramedic certified salary adjustments. Also in this law, grants authorizations to collect fees for services and fines, the subject of this testimony. Our current fees and fines schedule was established by Public Law 2902 in May 2007. While the recommended fees and fines were similar to this current proposal, a lesser schedule was implemented to allow for an incremental establishment uh, to reduce the economic impact to the businesses and general public. While this also, also allows Guam Fire Department to amend the existing schedule pursuant to the administrative adjudication law, we believe that the current proposal contains many new fees and fines not authorized and may have to be amended into law. The Guam Fire Department mission can cost approximately $35 million a year to sustain our response capabilities and a state of readiness that is expected by our island citizens. 90% of that amount is reliant on general fund appropriations. The Guam Fire Department continues to seek revenue enhancement to recover these costs and reduce reliance on the general fund. The services we provide are in fact recoverable as is done in municipalities across the nation. This can be key in future sustainment of operations of the Guam Fire Department and can ensure that our personal cons personnel consisting of firefighters, e one emergency medical technicians, dispatchers, um, administrative non-uniform employees, and mechanics are led, paid, trained, and equipped to perform their duties resulting in lives saved and property protected. The largest of our mission set is fire and emergency services. This includes firefighting, structural and wildland, hazardous material response, first response to medical emergencies, land and ocean search and rescue, confined space, high angle, fast water rescue, and extrication. We accomplish this with the strategic placement of our fire trucks, rescue and hazmat response units throughout the island, responding to over 5,000 incidents a year. Emergency medical service is our busiest mission with an average of 20,000 calls a year. This mission is served with three-tiered medical response system 
starting with the basic life support provided by any of our response units, that be fire trucks, rescue, or the inspectors that are in the Fire Prevention Bureau. The next tier is an ambulance response transport followed by our highest tier, advanced life support ALS units, where the first 20 minutes of emergency room care is done in a pre-hospital environment. Finally, our less celebrated yet very critical aspect to our overall mission is fire prevention through the enforcement of the fire code to advance fire and life safety for the public and first responders as well as property protection. We do this by providing a comprehensive and integrated approach to fire code regulation, hazardous management to the scope of this mission includes one, inspection of permanent temporary buildings, processes, equipment, systems and other fire related life safety situations. Two, investigation of fires, explosions, hazardous materials incidents and other related emergency incidents. Three, review of construction plans, drawings and specifications for life fire safety systems, uh, fire protection systems, access water supplies, processes hazardous materials and other fire and life safety issues. Four, fire and life safety education of fire brigades, employees, responsible parties and the general public. Five, existing occupancies and conditions, the design and construction of new buildings, remodeling of existing buildings and the additions to existing buildings. Six, design, installation, alteration, modification, construction, maintenance, repairs, servicing, testing of fire protection systems and equipment. Seven, installation, use, storage and testing of fire protection systems and equipment, I'm sorry. Installation, use, storage and handling of medical gas systems. Eight, access, Requirements for fire department uh, operations. Number nine, hazards from outside fires and vegetation, trash, building debris, and other materials. Ten, regulation and control of special events, including but not limited to assemblage of people, exhibits, trade shows, amusement parks, haunted houses, outdoor events, and other similar special temporary permanent occupancies. Eleven, interior decoration and finished decorations furnishings and other combustibles that contribute to fire spread, fire load and smoke production. 12, storage, use, processing, handling, on-site transportation of flammable and combustible gases, liquids and solids. 13, storage, use, processing, handling and on-site transportation, uh, transportation of hazardous materials. Number 14, control of emergency operations and scenes. 15, conditions affecting firefighter safety. 16, arrange, arrangement, design, construction, alteration of new and existing means of egress. Conservatively, the projecting the potential billable fees and fines for the aforementioned services, we found the following. That at a fire and emergency services, a, a potential income of 962,250, code enforcement at 3,745,000. $1,945. Potential revenue would be at $4,708,995. And a realistic revenue of a 60% collection rate would be at $2,824,917. I seek your continued support of the Guam Fire Department and look forward to establishing a new fees and fines schedule. The Guam Fire Department is committed to meet our island's expectations to provide the best service we can. And I am personally committed to work with each one of you to ensure the needs of our island are addressed with the realm of the fire service and public safety. Thank you again for allowing me to this opportunity to look forward to your questions and recommendations. Acting Fire Chief Denver. And we yeah. have a short little PowerPoint okay. that we can go over. We, we can definitely um, yeah. put that on now. Okay, and we see here's a fees and fines increased presentation. The purpose is to gain approval to increase GFD fees and fines scheduled to current rates, maximize available revenue potential, recover our costs, and provide services and increase safety compliance. This is much needed because of the, uh, the uh, high cost of running uh, and doing code enforcement with the little amount of power that we do have. Next slide, please. It all works into a framework of our mission, our budget, including our fee schedule in order to get to the end of and uh, do a complete mission for our best public safety. Next slide. Next slide, please. Mission and goal, the Guam Fire Department will respond to and mitigate all threats to life property, the environment and the territory of Guam and its surrounding waters. This will be accomplished through education, prevention and an effective response to fire, medical and environmental emergencies. The Guam Fire Department will be a fire service nationally recognized and accredited in the fire suppression fire prevention, emergency medical services, search and rescue, hazardous materials, response, 
and emergency medical dispatch. At a minimum, every fire station will house a fire engine, ambulance, and some type of specialty response apparatus such as a water tanker, ladder truck, rescue unit, or advanced life support unit. Firefighters will be fully equipped and trained both technically and physically to respond to all emergencies that pose a threat to the safety of life and property. And these are the mission and what we're looking at for future representation of the fire department as we're able to increase our fees and get uh, better funding. Go on, next, please. Guam Fire Department enabling authorities, 10, uh, chapter 10, Guam Code annotated. Chapter 72 is the fire services, emergency medical services, search and rescue, advanced life support. Chapter 73 covers our fire prevention and international fire code. The flame fund. Flame fund is covered under chapter 10 GCSA uh, 72, subsection 72, 106. It authorized and collect for fees for services and fines. The Guam Fire Department shall establish in accordance with the administrative adjudication law no later than August 1, 2006, a schedule of fees for the following services. That would be for the non-emergency use of amendments primarily for the transportation as opposed to emergency medical care under the circumstances where the person ordering the same does not reasonably believe and create fines for uh, creating fire hazards, uh, disobeying permit conditions, failing to correct hazardous conditions, and so forth, in order for us to collect revenue to help us with uh, different aspects of our operations, such as the training equipment and uh, maintenance and, and other uh, things needed. Public Law 2902 it would be the approval of fees for services provided by the Guam Fire Department. Notwithstanding any other law, the following rules and regulations established in the fees for the services attached are hereby approved and enacted into law. So on May 1st, 2007 was when the first schedule of fees was, was implemented. And those fees were very low at the time and remain low and must be addressed to, to meet the changing world. Code enforcement fees and fines for revenue enhancement. We're looking for code enforcement inspections, plans and review, fire permits, arson investigation. Our Fire Prevention Bureau is, is uh, tasked daily with uh, multiple requests and in order to process through these things, uh, we would need additional resources in order to, to create a system, a system where we will streamline it and, and become more effective and enforce our codes for the public safety of Guam. Um, emergency medical services, ambulance fees, advanced life support, as we said, we'll be addressing that on another uh, bill. And fire emergency services, emergency response, and non-emergency responses, and all of these would be uh, collectible under the flame fund. So as we break it down, fire emergency services, what we're looking at here is we've got uh, structure fires uh, estimation uh, with a proposed fee uh, based on 2016 cases. As we see in 2016, we responded to 145 case, uh, cases of structure fires. And we would look at a proposed uh, projected revenue of 40,000 plus. Activated alarms, we had 120 activated alarms. And that would be a uh, possible uh, projected revenue of 54,000. Uh, auto accidents between minor and serious, uh, minor being 176,000, and serious, we could be collecting as much as 21,000. Then we have the unauthorized controlled burns, hazmat responses, public services, all this totaling to about $962,250. And all of these revenues are based on proposed fees and based on the 20, calendar year 2016's uh, caseload. And again, for ca uh, case year 2016, we're looking at our level of fire inspections, reinspections, plan checks, permits issued, fire investigations, fire certification, and self inspections with a total uh, projected revenue value of $3,745,945. And of course, with a projected uh, realistic revenue collection of 60%, we would then look at four fire and emergency service code enforcement potential revenue of uh, in collection of two million eight hundred twenty four thousand nine hundred seventeen we're one behind yeah. there, there we go thank you thank you uh chief Manabusin, do you have a testimony you'd like to sub submit and yes ma'am thank you good afternoon honorable senators senator nelson Senator Bisco Lee and Senator Terlahi. I'm here in support of Bill 251 34 to update the Guam Fire Department's fee schedule. Revenue generated from an updated fee schedule will assist GFD 
and providing critical emergency services. I have reviewed Bill 251-34 and make the following recommendations. Remove all references or articles in Bill 251-34 that refer to the Uniform Fire Code and replace with International Fire Code. These references conflict with 10 GCA as it's currently written. Sp uh, subsection 73.111, International Fire Code adopted, and Subsection 73.112, updating of Uniform Fire Code, which is repealed. Replace Exhibit 1, Guam Fire Department Schedule of Fees and Charges with Rules and Regulations, Appendix A, as written in the proposed bill, with a table that reflects the types of operational permits listed in the International Fire Code. Although the codes are very similar, the types of permits are similar, there's actually a, a great deal of differences, such as exceptions, the tables, values, so on and so forth. These recommendations and other related topics have been discussed with Mr. Mesa and Mr. Alcario from your office, ma'am, and I will continue to assist them in, uh, with all the, the details. There's a lot of details that are involved, and based on our discussion, we'll have further uh, discussion on, on the details of the proposed recommendations. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chief Manabusan. We are tracking uh, some of the technicalities uh, that perhaps was not clear when we, was, we spoke with, with the team of the fire department, but we are addressing that and we'll make the corrections necessary so that the bill is concrete and whole. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Chief Castro. No, I don't have any testimony. I'm just here in support of Chief Berry and Chief Manbusan. Well, thank you for your support. Uh, Commissioner Santa Tomas. Okay, good afternoon again, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Speaker, Senator Bisco Lee. Uh, my name is Dennis Santa Tomas. I'm the Executive Director for the Guam Post Commission, Peace Officer Standards and Training. Um, so my understanding is that Bill 251-34 LS is focusing, focuses on implementing and, and amending the current fees and charges assessed by the Guam Fire Department, which was last assessed in 1997. Um, personally, I feel the bill should uh, be used as a model or because it sets precedence for all other uh, post commission members to uh, follow in instituting its own fee and charges schedule. So I think it should be a model as now that they're fine tuning it to to modernize it, I think that other post commission members should also look at it to, to look at modernizing theirs. This bill is important because it will help GFD with cost recovery and critical first responder needs that it provides 24 7 to the general public during both emergency and non emergency situations. It must also be mentioned that the Department of Defense, DOD, firefighting units look automatically toward GFD when their internal capabilities are no longer able to contain or respond to emergency situations that are under their federal purview. GFD fees and charges must be reassessed every year in order for the department to keep pace with the rising costs of personnel, supplies, fuel, equipment directly associated with the critical life support services it provides to the entire island. So I fully endorse and support Bill 251-34 LS because it will help provide a more realistic schedule of fees and charges that is consistent with the level of services GFD provides to all of Guam. And I would just, um, that concludes uh, what I have to say regarding the bill and I just had some other um, information that I'd just like to digress and share with the senators today. Well, crime on our beautiful island of Guam continues to challenge all our police officers who are doing the very best they can with very limited or diminishing resources. With the advent of technology and the internet, many crimes are now using sophisticated methodologies and equipment to help avoid getting caught or even traced by leaving little to no signatures that are necessary to conduct forensic crime solving uh, procedures. Now, with this massive military buildup that's planned for Guam, there will be some 4,000 to 5,000 active duty Marines, some 5,000 dependents, and maybe another 2,000 civil service workers that will be re relocated from Okinawa, Japan to Guam. So with these kind of numbers, our current population, which is estimated at about 170,000 right now, 
is set to jump up to as much as 182,000 or 7 percent increase in just a matter of a few years. So it is important for our local government to be aware of these, of, of the possible increases in crime associated with an increased Marine Corps population. I've provided this table uh, below that provides crime levels in cities in well-known military installations on the U.S. mainland to kind of give an idea of how crime statistics, crime statistics on Guam may be impacted. So if you can see in the first uh, tape, uh, entry there in Waiowa, Hawaii, where Schofield Barracks is located, there's about 19,000 population in that portion of Oahu, and that's how many crimes they have, violent 48 423 property for a total of 471. And as we progressively go up, there are larger bases. So as we go to Kaneohe, Hawaii, which is where Kaneohe Marine Corps Base is at, there's about 36,000 population in that locale. Then the numbers jump up to 84 and 833, respectively. Moving on to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, Jacksonville, population about 68,000. Now, now your violent crimes jump up to 230 and 1141 for a total of 1371. And then finally, in the largest one of them all, in Oceanside, California, Camp Pendleton, where you have about 175,000 population, there are 645 violent crimes, 4,421 4, property crimes, for a total crimes of 5,066. And comparing it to our crimes on Guam, what, the, what Chief uh, J.I. Cruz reported last February, for his 2016 numbers, we had for the entire island of Guam, 341 violent crimes and 3,086 3, property crimes for a total of three, four, two, seven total crimes on our island. Now, DOD has been consistent in identifying the need for improved Guam infrastructure to support DOD's critical requirements, particularly roadways, utilities, housing, etc. But it has yet to document the necessary peace officer capacity that will be needed to provide critical services to a larger island presence, which is directly associated by this military buildup. So using that table I provided, you can see there is a consistent increase in both violent and property cr crimes when comparing the smaller to the larger cities in the USA where military bases are, are located. Using these figures, it is safe to say that Guam's current crime levels May, o may only grow when the influx of, with the influx of 12,000 more island residents. So according to Andrew Schiller, he's a founder and president of NeighborhoodScout.com, where I pulled all these numbers out. It's, a, it's kind of a real estate agency, but they're required to report the crime statistics in all these jurisdictions. So anybody can go there and you can look at all the crime, da crime data. The answer may lie in the demographics of the American military. Military bases tend to have high con concentrations of young single men living together in very close quarters. One possible explanation for these surges in crime rates could be that young men separated from their parents, wives, families, and communities may feel more temptation to commit certain t types of crimes and oftentimes just for fun or when they are under the influence of liquor or drugs. So my point to all this discussion focuses on the need for increased peace officer capacity, and DOD must have some responsibility in helping our island of Guam attain that, ne attain that necessary level. Because, all of the people, because of all the people and personnel, it is relocating to Guam. Guam peace officers, many of them right here in this room, um, are doing already so much with very limited personnel and diminishing operational resources. So, my, um, my recommendation to you, Senator, is it is time that this important critical need be discussed with DOD and not just roadways and buildings and, and schools, but uh, we need DOD to help us and work with us to determine where it can help us in this area of building the necessary peace, of, peace officer capacity to deal with an increased population for the future. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Mr. Lin Songen. Uh, good afternoon, Senator good afternoon. Nelson, Vice Speaker Terlahe, Senator Lee, uh, Fire Chief, and all the uh, firefighters here in the hall. Thank you for, uh, very much for coming and support of this bill. Uh, 
but I don't support this bill. Because uh, first of all, in your Section 1 intention, your reason is because of the uh, financial crisis. We already have 48 special funds which totaled $226 million. And that special fund is not supporting the general fund. Now, even you support this bill or this bill passed, it will not help the fire department open the two fire stations that's closed because it's only 2.8 million. Now, and I have so many concerns, like for example, the uh, proposed fees, the proposed fees increased by almost 1,000%. And this would hurt the small business owners. And my paramount concern is the poor, the poor families, because they'll be charged $279 per incident for transportation by using the, uh, the ambulance. So what is the purpose of public service? It's in the last page. If we will charge the citizen $279 for, for helping them go to the hospital, I think uh, this is uh, unhuman to charge especially the people that cannot afford to pay that much. If they believe that ambulance is too expensive to transport them, Maybe they can use other kind of transportation that is free because these are the people that don't have cars, that got, they got problem with cars. No, it's in the last page. You check the last page. $279 per incident, public service. Yeah, and and, and that my other point is, where did they came up with this, uh, with this uh, proposed fees? Is there any basis? or data that would support them because it's 1,000% increase. It's just uh, ridiculous that uh, they will propose that kind of fees. And then uh, the, my other concern is we already have a poor record of recording, managing the special funds. Most of the special funds are not going to the proper fund. It's being transferred. And now we are trying to you know, raise fees again for, for the plain fund. If you will pass this bill, let that fund go to the general fund. That is the problem, the general fund. So why you have to put another fund to the special fund, which is useless, which will not help the general fund? That's what you need to do. Transfer money from the special fund to general fund. Just like the man, yep, this plain fund, this 2018 appropriation, they, they have 1.1 million 303,734 appropriated to them alone. So what happened with that fund? That's why it's important that there's reporting requirement before the end of the fiscal year so that the senators can review what happened to these funds can conduct oversight hearing, identifying the problem and helping them how to spend it wisely. It's not about criticizing, it's about identifying, collaborating, guiding, and helping the, uh, the uh, department heads. And then there's so many defects in this bill, like for example, unannounced inspection for existing permit. In page six, this could be a source of abuse or other company or big establishment can be singled out. There's already, uh, they already proposed inspection for permit renewals. 
they will be inspected already. Why, why again, you will authorize them to, to conduct an inspection again for an announced inspection? That's, that's uh, some of my concerns, but there's still a lot of defects in this, in this bill. And uh, you need help from your fellow uh, senators to scrutinize this further. Uh, because the problem here is the general fund. So concentrate with the general fund, not a special fund. And uh, you see, uh, this one is, this problem are all very easy to solve. You see, it's the, the governor just had to enforce his political will to exercise the provision in the Organic Act. What is that provision? The governor had the general supervision and control of all the bureau, department, agencies, and instrumentalities of executive department of Guam. It is specified their agency. It doesn't matter if it's autonomous or not autonomous. He's still the head. He's the most powerful man here in Guam. So what does, why did I specify that? It means he can transfer the money from GPA, from GWA, from Port Authority, from Airport Authority, any excess money. Because they're financed by the we the people. Without we the people, there's no revenue for GPA, GWA, Port Authority, and airport. They cannot just be using all the, all the money that is excess for their own good. Or it will also backfire on them. Just like now. They'll be also for law. Because it got to be equal, all agency. So, the governor need to exercise his political will to transfer the money that is, he can get from those agencies. And he's authorized by the Organic Act. Nobody can stop him, nobody, no law. Even the board, he's above the board because he's mandated by the U.S. Congress. He also appointed those board in every uh, agency. That will solve all the problem. See? Because that's why, uh, and, uh, and the people in the, and the workers in the, on those autonomous agencies will understand because they'll be affected also. These are the main assets of the government of Guam, those agencies that don't have any competition. As a small business, so many competition, and we're trying to survive. But them, they monopolize the port, the water, the power, the airport. What? What is, their what is their purpose? Only for themselves? No more for the people of Guam, generally? And because of the people of Guam, they survive. They become GPA, they become GWA. If there's no people here, what revenue will they have? Do you think there will be 500 GPA workers, GWA workers and others? Nothing. That's why in this trouble time, the governor need to exercise his organic act, power and duties. Page 32. And that supersedes all law, even ban law. That's in or local law. Because he is the most powerful mandated by the organic act of Guam by the U.S. Congress. And you don't have to raise fees. You don't have to furlow all the workers. You don't have to do all this, put taxes against the small business and, and the people. See, sometimes I think that, yes, it's, it's not manufactured, but because it's the wrong system that was followed by the three administration and nobody tried to correct it. So there's mismanagement. It's not only on part of the governor, but also this body because you also failed to be on top of every agency that you have oversight on. Just like what Mary Rhodes have said, lucky Senator Vice Speaker Terlai already introduced a law that would fix that for the uh, hotels, uh, 
or vacation rental that are not paying taxes. See, that's why you need to concentrate on, on those, on those agencies that you have uh, oversight. But the main point here is the governor. That would be his legacy. Save the government of Guam without prolonging anybody, without closing anything. And he can do it. It's just in his political will. And it is mandated by the Organic Act. Uh, that's all, Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Linsongen. Just, just to clarify for you, sir, um, the bill does not address emergency medical services. So, like, if an ambulance comes to the house, this bill does not address the change in fees. It's more for fire and uh, the fire code. So, it doesn't impact the emergency medical services fees. So, those fees remain the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Battalion Chief, did you want to give testimony? Yeah, just, just a little insight in the history of the fire. Sure. Uh, we were established in 85. Um, during that time, the ambulance service and a lot of our services were free. They were absolutely free. So what had happened, obviously, uh, compact impact affected us. We have an influx of uh, people coming into our island that the federal government said You're, you can utilize these services and, and all this stuff. So then the demand on our, our resources started happening in the, the mid-90s. And uh, towards the late 90s, I believe we decided to, to implement a fee for the ambulance. So that was an external thing that we didn't foresee that happened. Uh, we absorbed all the costs from uh, equipment, personnel, transport, all that. So it was a loss at the beginning, right? We weren't charging. So then we tried to recuperate some of those fees. Of course, when we try to incorporate some of those fees or recover them, the billing process is a little bit different. We're lucky if we get 80% of what comes back, right? And that's the only ones who have insurance. Again, we, we have that attitude of the governor or homeless has a broken arm, would you treat them differently? Absolutely not. A broken arm is a broken arm to us, right? So then we go into 9-11. Uh, 9-11 happens. More uh, things develop and, and more responsibilities are put on the fire department. Do we have the best hotels, the best beaches in the world? Absolutely not. You've got Bali, you've got these places, but what's one of the difference? We don't have hotels crashing to the ground on the first earthquake. We have security. Visitors that visit our island, if something bad happens to them, they know that we're going to be there. Okay? And then what about our island community? Our island community has always had this idea. If you look at the history of the fire stations, they were clinics back in the day, Barragatas and Hanya, so and so. So a lot of people do is they will not go to GMH and get an $800 uh, emergency room bill. They'll tend to come to us. And again, we absorb those costs. Those are costs that are not seen. Uh, Again, going back to 9-11, uh, since uh, Chief Joey took over, one of the biggest things was to address uh, WND or terrorist threats that come to Guam. GFD is a leading uh, partner in, that, in the law enforcement. Uh, a lot of our technical uh, personnel that respond since we've upstanded this, uh, this unit, it shows. We've had fentanyl, we've had actual uh, uh, calls uh, acts of terrorism that we've responded to. Uh, and again, you know, cost to that is absorbed by us, okay? So I like that, uh, Senator Nelson, you, you clarified with that, that gentleman before because what we don't want to have is we don't want to have anger that this is a reactive bill. It, no, in our history, since 85, we have probably come to you guys two or three times to say, hey, we cannot continue to operate this way without changes. So again, thank you, uh, all three of you, for, for listening. And I'm definitely in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Battalion Chief. Yes, Chief Berger, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Senator. <clears throat> First off, I just want to clarify, uh, one is on the PowerPoint. Um, we did have a table there. just want to make sure everybody's uh, and clarified that our schedule fees uh, have been presented to you and that that's not the limit to the schedule fees that we're looking at. That was just a uh, 
a uh, select in order to show a, uh, a projected outcome uh, where it could be. And of course, then with the pr proposed fees schedule that we have uh, provided to you, we could actually probably see a, a, a better projection. Um, and on the note of what the gentleman uh, spoke of, in, in, uh, and I want to thank him for his testimony. It's, it's good to hear the passion from the people and, and their concerns, uh, because any fee increases is, is, is a concern for everybody. And this is not a reactionary bill uh, to the uh, current financial crisis. It's, it's a raising of our, our fees and, uh, and addressing our fee schedule uh, to a level that it, it, it should have been addressed uh, before now. It just happens to be a coincidence uh, that we're in the situation we are, and it's it's nice that we're getting to this point. And as Chief Uggen had mentioned, our services uh, since our inception have expanded and increased. We've taken on more responsibilities, and as such, um, the cost to run that, the type of equipment that we need to provide that service, and what the uh, community ha has expected from us has increased with no increase in, in revenue to, to uh, acquire that. So having these fees schedules put into place, and putting the money into a flame fund account, then we don't have to worry about the general fund allocating the money, but getting it from a fund that we were able to get it from. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I, I'll open it up to the, my colleagues if they have any questions. Sure. Thank you. Senator Lee. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Um, I think maybe Chief Uggen kind of touched on it, but can you just reiterate um, for the public and those viewing at home, when was the last time that these fees and fines were changed? That was in uh, 2007, as we said. Uh, that's when they were implemented, and they stayed that way. Okay. With all these increases, if this bill ends up passing, how much do you anticipate revenues at GFD to increase? I'd say the projected revenue increase uh, by the tables that we prevented, uh, presented with the reasonable uh, rate of collection at 60%, we're looking at that uh, just over $2 million. Uh, and this is just with the fire fees that we're addressing in this bill. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about UCBs. So that's, I think, the last page 20. Mm -hmm. um, it's listed as other fees for uncontrolled burns. It's $500 per incident. So I, I kind of just wanted to, to reiterate to the public, what's the procedure? Do they go to the fire station to be able to get a permit? And then that's, that would be, they wouldn't be cited for this? Or how can they avoid um, having this UCB uh, well, fee imposed? When they're issued a burning permit, uh, it gives them conditions to burn. Okay. Uh, it, it's not a uh, uh, we can burn any time permit. It, it allows them to be able to burn during uh, certain hours of the day and during daylight hours mainly. And it has to have conditions where they have to have a water source within a reasonable uh, distance and they have to have a reasonable distance away from a, a structure, you know, within, they have to have a, like, was it 15 feet? Uh, 15 feet, 50 feet from a structure. Um, but materials. yeah, it cannot burn hazardous materials. It has to be green materials. There's no plastics, no styrofoam, no no pallets, uh, no or offensive. If a neighbor does complain of the smoke, uh, because the smoke can affect patients with asthma, right? Uh, small children. So once they do complain, you have to put it out. So if, for example, somebody has a burning permit, and we go in and tell them that they need to extinguish it, and we extinguish it and they were to reburn again, then of course that becomes a violation because he was told to put it out and reasons for it. And how much are those burn permits to, how much is it to acquire a burn permit? Yeah, currently there's no fee for a burning permit. So, and they can go to any fire station and fill out a form and... In their jurisdiction. In their jurisdiction, they can In do their that. jurisdiction, okay. So that's one way that they could potentially avoid this $500 uncontrolled burn fee. Right, or they can go to prevention to get a burning permit also. Okay. Also on page 20 and other fees, there's a listing of rescue boat towing service, and that's at $50 per towing service. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, many times we get uh, recreational boaters that 
in fishermen who go out on their boats uh, fishing or uh, whatever recreational that they're doing, the, and their engine breaks down and they have no way to get back. And our rescue services that are incorporated to then uh, respond to them uh, within their our, our response area and tow them back to uh, mer the marina. So uh, is it a majority of the time it's an engine trouble or is it they're out of gas? Um, usually it's engine trouble. Uh, and as far as uh, the details of each case, I'm, I'm not sure the percentage of and does the $50 that's proposed, does that cover the gas for the, res the rescue vehicle or the rescue boat that would go out to assist? Um, I would have to get the figures on that, but it basically, I mean, it depends on the distance that we're looking at. You know, if it's right outside the harbor and bringing them in. No problem. Then it's not a problem. But if it's, you know, two, three miles out and we have to tow them back in, then it becomes mm -hmm. an issue. And we burn up a lot more fuel bringing them back in than we would going out. Right. So I guess my question is, is this $50 per towing service, I mean, maybe we should consider having that be a little bit more flexible, maybe increase up to a certain amount so that it can it's, cover it's at least to, the cost of fuel? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, we, we would be willing to look at that to where we could have a flat uh, rate for the service and then in, in with that an additional uh, fee for the fuel expended during that time. Right, because that's not even, that doesn't even cover the personnel that would have to mm -hmm. man the, the boat yeah. and head I mean, out there. And if you look at it, there's all different factors, uh, ma'am, is, uh, Senator, is the is when we do towing services. Uh, it could be a glassy day and no waves. It could be a choppy day like today is, or it could be a storm related. So um, the, the threat to life of the individuals on the boat and also the threat to life of our rescuers performing the service becomes of, of a matter. So when we turn around, we start seeing fees like this. Um, we could start looking at all the different scenarios and coming up with uh, proposed fees to cover that, but then you start looking at a fee schedule that would really be getting out of hand. And so we're trying to find something that is reasonable and, and amenable to, to the, the people at the same time being able to provide us some kind of funding to I support I think it. something that's kind of in recent memory was the fire that was, um, that took place in Harmon at, um, in Harmon Industrial Park. It burned for, I think, about a day. And yeah. so I just wanted to get a sense from you about if you have an idea of the man hours that took to kind of control that fire and how much you assessed in fees for that, I mean, a fire of that magnitude. Ma'am, the, and that's a very good point that you bring up. We, we collected very, very minimal compared to the magnitude of that particular case. Yeah, I think we, the, the fines that they received was just, chief was it about 700 bucks? was only seven hundred dollars and when you when you take a look at that and you you look at all the equipment that was used the amount of water that was used just the water alone the the personnel the equipment i mean all the agencies that inv were involved the the dangers that were involved the the pollution that damaged the environment and the the inconvenience that was placed on the surrounding businesses the it was it was a high cost seven hundred dollars did not cut it. Very good point, ma'am. Thank you. And so would the fees that are um, detailed in this bill, would they assist you in, in incidences like that where you can kind of assess a higher fine at this point? Yes, ma'am, definitely. And that's basically right in line with what Chief Ogun was speaking of. It, it basically connects exactly to that. Uh, in history, everybody was expecting all these services for free. And even if these, these events prolong a day, a week, and you only gave one example of an event that was very, very obvious to the community, high profile, highly visible. We have other events, ma'am, that go on for weeks, sometimes months, deep-seated fires that, that take up a lot of our resources. Thank you. And yes, Chief Hogan. A lot of these, these fees that uh, we're reviewing, they're discretionary, right? You, uh, Senator Lee, you brought up the UCBs being, we're not out to hurt the mom and dad who cleans up his yard on Saturday and burns the leaf. That is a cultural thing for our island. We all know that. Uh, but we, we also want to, I'm sorry, we also want to hold people responsible who are reckless in that 
burn, leave, and then this, we have a grass fire that now threatens your home. Those, those are the people that we're looking at, right? Uh, again, very discretionary on your part. You look at the boat rescue. If you look at our response, we have public uh, service, which is different from a non-emergency, which is different from an emergency. There's no way that we're going to watch a guy's boat break down and watch him drift to, you know, Manila. It's not going to happen. We're going to go out there. Our territorial waters, I believe, are 10 miles out. Often we go further than that. Our capabilities are a little bit further. So, you, again, you, you, uh, these are discretionary type things. Again, uh, we embrace or, or we are encouraged with the fact that you're going to review them and, and use common sense when it needs to be done and, uh, and help us out. And this is where if, you, if a breakdown of services that we provide needs to be clarified, I know the chiefs here have been working uh, night and day on this to try to come up with a, a happy medium that one will not impact our services, will not anger the community as a whole, and it doesn't look like it's uh, um, reactive. But, you know, these are, these are decisions, obviously, uh, we lean to, to island leadership to provide us. Thank you, Chief. I think just one last point, Madam Chair, or one maybe opportunity for clarification. So on page two of the bill, um, under section 2C, proceeds from the Guam Fire Department fees for services and that all fees collected pursuant to this act would go to the flame fund except that upon the issuance of an executive order promulgated by Imega Law in Guahan. Um, has that ever happened in the past where executive orders um, have allowed for these restricted special funds, these restricted flame funds to be used for other purposes other than for public safety in the Guam Fire Department? Um, not to my knowledge at this time. Uh, I, I do believe having that provision in there would help with uh, if the flame fund would be needed for that purpose and it allow the, uh, the governor to be able to, to bring in, uh, to move funds over to help out in other aspects of it. You know, and if we're also looking at, as you were stating earlier about some of the fees that covering the cost of gasoline and covering the cost, um, the flame fund, as you know, doesn't cover that part of the, of, of our function, but it would be something to look at too, to maybe have an amendment to the flame fund to where there could be a percentage that could go towards uh, an operational cost yeah, because our general fund does cover uh, a great deal of things, uh, but putting it into uh, where we're, we don't want to put these kind of fees and fines into a general fund uh, format, keeping in the flame fund. And then if we have to, uh, we'll look at having flame fund be able to cover a certain percentage of uh, operational costs, it would help. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Lee. Just to, just to shed some light, the, the purpose of this provision in the bill is we discovered that um, revenue was being moved out of the flame fund and it was not being reimbursed. And so this is kind of, this is not kind of, this is doing the exact prudent thing to do where if they're going to remove revenue from the flame fund, it will have to be reimbursed because historically, perhaps in the most recent year, 2016 and 2017, close to almost a little over $2 million was moved out of the flame fund and never reimbursed. So that's why we included this provi provision that if it is removed, it must be reimbursed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Vice Speaker. Thank you all for being here and your testimony um, so the purpose of the bill is, there were three purposes. One is to schedule fees for non-emergency use uh, of an ambulance, um, conducting building inspections, reviewing building plans, and issuance of permits. And so attached to the bill is a whole list of existing fees and then um, the new amounts. And I think Mr. Lasangan is correct. If you look at these amounts, you might be startled, right? There you go from $35 a lot of the times up to over $300. So I just want to ask you, um, 
are these what you recommend, the changes? Is this a recommendation from the fire department? And do you think that these are reasonable? Thank you, ma'am. Um, the fees that you see mm -hmm. on the attachment there were based off the PowerPoint that was uh, put based on power submitted by Chief St. Nicholas. Yes. Now, Senator Nelson staffer, I guess, related the PowerPoint to whatever the existing, uh, the way the existing table was made and just related whatever across to, to the, uh, the values there. <clears throat> now, there are other uh, areas that need to be permitted that would require variations of, of value in, in terms, you know, what would the fee that would be assessed and that would require a much greater detailed uh, discussion to go over each individual uh, item that needs to be permitted. <clears throat> so I, I cannot say that every single item there and uh, given across the board value because some would be less or perhaps more. And a good example, looking at that particular table, it doesn't cover, uh, like, let's say, self-inspections. And uh, self-inspections are added as other fees on page 20. Yeah. A new fee would be established for $147 per incident. Yeah, so for this, this particular table doesn't uh, have uh, self-inspections included in it. Page 20. I know I'm turning through. Do you currently charge a, a self-inspection fee? No, ma'am. All right. For the, for the parts of this bill or the schedule that's attached, the exhibit one, it's a schedule of fees and these are they, they look to be existing fees, right? That these are being enforced right now. And so this bill would just increase the ones that are listed here. Yes, the, the existing fees right now, there's, there's variations depending on like uh, numbers uh, based on like square footage. Yes. Uh, numbers of like uh, devices, numbers of appliances and a sprinkler system. So it needs to be broken down a little bit further for clarification. Further That's, than what is in here? Yes, ma'am. This particular table that you're looking at, Appendix A, mm -hmm. is based off the international, I'm sorry, the Uniform Fire Code. Exhibit 1. <clears throat> yes, it, under Exhibit 1. And you're saying it's... it's this, this is based it's off the Uniform Fire Code. Okay. So... So in, you want to transfer these amounts and... Uh, uh, make them match up with the International Fire Code. Yes, and they did provide a, a table that we can use. I saw use. the table, but there are no amounts on the table. of The International Fire Code table that you provided did not include uh, any amounts. Yes, ma'am, I understand it. And the reason being is that negotiation has to be done between Senator Nelson and Chief St. Nicholas. All right, well, let's say that yeah. these items on this Uniform Fire Code, uh, let's just talk about one as an example. Um, because almost all the fees here increased from 35 to uh, $392.50, or they went from $95 to, to $1,065. And um, if these are the same you know, types of permits that are allowed under the International Fire Code, would, are these the fees that you're recommending? Or you're saying we're going to start from scratch and renegotiate all these amounts? The fees that are recommended in that table uh, with the Uniform Fire Code, what basically we're going to do is take the International Fire Code and Match we're going to them. move that over and attach the fees okay. and put them into the table right. uh, where they would be applicable. And then the areas in the International Fire Code that are more detailed than the Uniform Fire Code was, we will be assessing uh, okay. the proper fee to that one that would be within the same uh, rate that we're looking at All right. on these. Okay. Um, Ma'am, there's also some other areas that are not covered in this table, and it would be better if we sit down with uh, I think, yeah. Senator Nelson's staff, okay. and, and I'll give you a good example. There are portable fire extinguishers, uh, contractors that are out there servicing fire protection equipment, sprinklers. They, they are not permitted by the Guam Fire Department 
all they need to do is go get a license from the contractor's license board mm -hmm. and it doesn't <clears throat> it doesn't mean that they're fully qualified we need to have like a check and balance with so, a lot of these right Chief, now you can go out there and get a business license to service right. portable fire extinguishers mm -hmm. with no background Perfect. no training and we're catching a lot of these out there where we would find portable extinguishers like that that are not properly serviced and that's just one example okay so and there's just so much details all right Chief, that are so involved. if i may summarize there are there are things that you would like to regulate under in guam that are regulated by the international fire code that are not included in our current fees right that is correct ma all right i understand so let's just talk about the current fees and maybe the, these proposed increases. I just want to be sure that um, because it was our intention, we did not want to increase fees for emergency services, ambulances. That's not the intent of this bill, right? Um, maybe non-emergency ambulance right. use. The, the purpose of this bill is to address the, the fire code. Yeah, fire code, inspections, permits. Um, all right, so if we could just go to the, um, on page 20. So on page 20, there are a list of uh, some other fees, they're titled, that look like they're not currently being charged. Is that correct? These are all, well, most of them are new, the ones that don't have a, a, a strikeout? That is correct, ma'am. Okay, and then, in, and I guess, Chief Burrier, I just wanted to make sure, because on your PowerPoint, you include under revenue enhancement the slide had code enforcement fees and fines, and then emergency medical services, and then fire and emergency services. So I know those are all potential for revenue enhancement, but- for Those this are potential, and those are things we're looking at and being discussed. Um, as before this purpose of this bill, we're just strictly looking at fire-related uh, fees. Okay. Um, as far as the em EMS services, that, that's something to be addressed at another okay, time. Great. All right, so then under, under fees again, the other fees on page 20, could you just clarify under fire investigation this will be a new charge and and is this for is this going to be charged to everyone where a fire occurred that's what we're requesting ma'am um okay because this is not related to any code enforcement, it's kind of related. It looks to me, I mean, a lay person uh, to be an emergency response. That's, you know, and I just want to, uh, you know, ensure the public that, you know, we are, the public is paying huge amounts of money for a fire department, for, for you all to be very qualified and for all, you know, your equipment and services. And so, yeah, we don't intend to add on top of that, right? For emergency I'm, services, uh, you know, uh, uh, something that would discourage the use of our, our fire department. So fire investigation, I, I don't know. I'm just wondering, for example, um, you know, accidental fires. Who's going to pay? The homeowners? Um, yeah, ma'am, uh, Senator, uh, a lot of these fees, if you, when you look at them, I mean, they do look a lot. But when you start breaking down how the fees are, then you start looking at if there is a fire in a structure and we go to investigate it mm -hmm. and we determine an arson outcome and uh, the cause of the fire mm -hmm. uh, and all the responses that we do that we end up charging for, a lot of these fees are addressed in uh, homeowner fire insurance. Oh, okay. And then we would end up billing these insurance companies for this. And then most of the time, our revenue collection would be coming from insurance policies. I see. All right. Um, can I add to that? Uh, yes. I'll give you a good example. When Cabras exploded yes. in 2002, we conducted a fire investigation, mm -hmm. origin and cause. Fire department, we did ours. The insurance industry did theirs. The insurance industry billed GPA close to a quarter million dollars for that fire investigation. Mm -hmm. The Guam Fire Department's bill is zero. Now, their, their report and our report was just about identical. And a lot of, in most cases, their report was based off our report. I see. So again, $275 sounds like a lot to the layperson. But if you really look at the actual cost for a fire investigation, it's really a, a whole lot more than $275. Yeah, I would expect that, but 
are all, I mean, are, is a fire investigation conducted on every fire? The more advanced fire investigations is where this would apply to. In most cases, when our fire companies respond, it's what they call a company officer level investigation, where it's, it's standard, they will go out to a fire. Mm -hmm. it's, it's basically obvious the cause of the fire. So that would not require a, a, a full scale fire investigation. It's only when the cause is undetermined, suspicious in nature, or it's obvious that it was intentionally set, that they would call the Fire Prevention Bureau to basically right. do this type of investigation. And, and that's where that would come in. Okay. See, in that, most that cases, sounds more reasonable. it won't even be able, we won't even be able to collect that $275. Right. In a lot of cases where we go out to, to these intentional fires, they're burning like abandoned vehicles or, or in a lot of cases, we, there's nobody to collect the money from. That's so this $275, mm -hmm. it, it's just a fee. And like Chief Barrier mentioned, is something that perhaps the insurance may end up having to pay. All right. And what about the, the item structure fire? This, it's a fee for $279. Are we charging the person who owns the structure for responding to the fire? Is that what this is? This fee is very low compared to the permitting fees. What I'm, I'm on page 20. Right below fire investigation is structure fire. Yeah, so, so this, this fee, as you, as you see it, is basically we have units that respond and resources that are used at a fire uh, and equipment that's, that are used. And, and a lot of the equipment that we also use is, is disposable in nature to mm -hmm. where we would end up having to replace it. Okay. Uh, this kind of fee would then go towards the flame fund to where we'd be able to uh, purchase Supplies. items uh, that are expended during that time. Especially, you know, when you start looking at uh, a structure fire that has a hazmat situation in it, because a lot of materials in a house are hazardous to your health and then they would have to wear uh scbas going in wearing respirators having uh, certain filters and uh and other items that you'd have to have and so a lot of this stuff would come with the fact that we would need to to replace those uh, personal protective items all right maybe if i could just suggest if it probably would be useful if you spell these out in more detail so that uh, the public knows when they will be charged and when they won't. There was a comment, uh, I don't remember if it was in the newspaper or the radio about, oh, we're going to be afraid to call the fire department now because we might be charged. And we don't want to encourage that. And like, and like the battalion yeah. chief said, we don't want anger from the public. So what we want is just, yeah, right. we want to show how it's reasonable. And, and, and I agree, it's not this fee by itself. Yeah when you have to use that kind of material, it's not unreasonable, but if you could just explain it, as you have done with many of the other permitting yeah. fees during you know, all the years that you've been doing this, they're, they're, they're more detailed. Mm -hmm. And then, so then the, the other two, um, I just wanna make sure these are not like emergency responses, motor vehicle accident, you're, there are charges for a minor and charges for a serious accident. So what is this for? What are these fees for? Just a response? When that was uh, placed there, the, that's, again, another cost recovery mechanism again. Oh, okay. Um, well, oh, we minor have meaning minor accident. I thought <laughs> you meant minor, a minor. Okay, well, <laughs> sorry, but yeah, no, why are got, we charging to respond to motor vehicle accidents, I guess? Well, response, you have, you have uh, engine companies that will respond to these vehicle accidents and uh, they have to perform certain functions. One is they're doing, uh, they have to secure the scene for safety of, uh, of our response EMS personnel and making sure that there's, uh, they minimize the extent of any uh, vehicles coming into the scene and causing injury to uh, the victims and to our, our rescue personnel. They also have, uh, where they need to secure the vehicles, the, the batteries need to be, um, uh, the batteries in each vehicle have to be uh, disconnected we also have to uh, properly mitigate the airbag situation because having a rescuer inside a vehicle of a trapped victim and that air, if the airbag has not been deployed, we have a danger of that airbag being deployed and injuring people. Uh, there's also other dangers within the new vehicles, such as the hybrid vehicles, uh, electric vehicles and stuff. So there, there is uh, a certain degree of, of risk and specialty equipment, and again, that's going to be used in, in uh, these different types of scenarios. Disposed. But as you say, uh, ma'am, is 
uh, the table that's on here, of course, is, is going to be amended to meet the International Fire Code, and the other fees also will be addressed to give a better definition of, of uh, why they're being uh, assessed. All right. And, yeah, I'm not asking you to justify, you know, what you do when you respond, because mm -hmm. we want you to respond. And I guess yes. I'm just trying to make sure if, if these are, you know, we're going to charge everybody to respond to motor vehicle accidents, I, I don't want that. You know, I would like to take those off this list and we'll just stick with the list with the code enforcements, the inspections, the uh, building codes and, um, and the permits because they seem more optional, right? And uh, then emergency response. I guess, you know, I feel like the, the public's already paying for the emergency response and um, that I just want them to be very, I want it to be very clear that the fire department, they are going to respond in emergencies, whether you pay or you don't pay for, you know, getting people out of vehicles or whatever you got to do mm -hmm. when you're there. And, and, and so, yes, and I, I know the whole point of this bill was to add to the flame fund, but in hopes of relieving the general fund, right? And it looks like the general fund is paying the bulk because the, the bulk of the fire department's expenses are, are personnel. And so we're, we're not going to be able, by using just the flame fund, to relieve a huge portion of the operations costs for the fire department, right? Because right. the flame fund's limited in what we can use it for. Personnel's right. not included, is that right? The personnel's not included right. in the flame fund. It's, right. a, it's, addressing, think, it's addressing a lot of the needs that we, yeah. we have to provide for that the general fund does not in, uh, is not able to provide right. us. Well, we are, we are hoping that, uh, yeah, judicious use of that flame fund would help relieve the, the amount that needs to be appropriated from the general fund, right? So we're going to continue to look at that. But I thank you for your help in this. And if, if we could just um, let us know, I guess, so we're going to need to amend this bill. You don't want us to pass this until it's matched up with the International Fire Code. That's correct. All right. Um, okay. And... and but I would, if you could show existing fees when you lay those out, because I think this is very helpful that the public sees immediately, you know, through the strike throughs that these fees exist. They are already being charged. This is nothing new. It's, they're changing the amounts, right? Mm -hmm. and, well, and then the new ones are, are much more obvious. And those are probably the ones we're going to, you know, um, question you more on. And that's because of things like this. I want to make sure emergency response is not going to be dependent on any kind of fee or, or that well, people would be yeah. discouraged from calling. I'll, I'll assure you, uh, Senator, um, our response to the, to the people of Guam will never be dependent on a fee or being able to collect a fee. We will always respond and provide our service and rescue and provide the service to the best of our ability from the beginning to the end uh, without the intent of, uh, of collection the being able to assess fees and collect any monies that we're able to will benefit us and benefit the community by allowing us to provide better care and and ensure their safety at a, at a better level so it, but it is not a factor for us to respond to you we don't identify that as oh you know we can't collect that so we're not going to go there it, we will definitely be responding all right so thank you very much thank you Okay, I believe that exhausts our agenda for the day. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate your hard work. Uh, we are still going to meet again to submit a bill um, as amended in committee to address some of the concerns and to be more holistic when we and, and exact when we talk about the International Fire Code. Uh, we'd like to do this within the next five days because we want to make sure that we have this in time for our next session. Uh, so thank you very much for coming. This now concludes our hearing. It is now 2.41 in the afternoon. Thank you and God bless. Thanks, ma'am.